So welcome to the IC on Eye on Edge, Navigating Ocular Emergencies. So I'd request Dr. Anand sir to start his talk <laughs> on sealing the gap and how to repair corneal tears. Okay. Good morning to all of us. <laughs> I'll just start off the talks. Okay. So the talk that I've been given is uh, effective corneal tear management. Now it is a true emergency which needs Im immediate care and it is the major cause of preventable monocular blindness. The prevalence is around 2.4%. Majority of them are sustained at home or workplace and blunt trauma is more common than sharp objects. Now children, young adults and men are more prone to injuries. Uh, recreational, sports related and firecracker carry the worst prognosis. Majority of them occur at the workplace and the repair should be done within 24 hours to prevent the risk of infection and to prevent any post-trauma sequelae. Now this is the modified Birmingham eye tra trauma classification which classifies injuries as uh, globe injury and periocular injuries. The globe injury is further divided into closed and the open and then the periocular injury is nothing but the agnesal ad ad adjacent structures that are also involved. Or you can also classify it as a type of injury, whether the pupil is involved or not, the grade based on the visual acuity and the zones of involvement. Now a detailed history on to the mode, duration, time and object of injury is very important. It is also important to differentiate between perforating and penetrating injury and that can be ascertained by the Seedles test. A proper slit lab examination is required to look for any occult scleral tear or any visible intraocular foreign body or possible anterior capsular breach or vitreous in the wound. Recording of the visual acuity is very, very important for medical legal purposes. The primary goal is to achieve a watertight globe and to maintain the structural integrity as much as possible. The secondary goals are to remove any disrupted lens fragments, any abscission of the uveal tissue if there is prolapse or any relieving the vitreous incarceration or removing any visible foreign body. Now it is very important to note that no antibiotics or ointment should be given in an open globe injury and generally broad spectrum antibiotic drops are preferred. The patients has to be started on oral or intravenous antibiotics along with injection TT if required. The patients might have to be kept in fasting if a general anesthesia case is uh, being planned and counseling is very important as to the guarded prognosis of the treatment that we are doing, the need for multiple injuries and chances of endophthalmitis. And it's also very important to get high risk form and then whether MLC certificate is required or not. Now the surgical principle generally it is done as GA if it's a very large open globe injury or you can do it in peribulbar or retrobulbar with facial to prevent any expulsion of intraocular material. A thorough saline wash has to be done to remove the debris or any particulate matter over the tear site. And generally, a 10 nylon interrupted suture is used for the cornea, a 90 is used for the limbus, and an 80 or an 80 vehicle is used for the scleral repair. And if the tear is at the sclerocorneal junction, a congenital peritomy has to be done to look at the extent of the tear. The length of the sutures has to be around 1.5 to 2 millimeter distance, equidistant on either side, and must be around 90% depth. Now, if it is a perpendicular laceration, then the entry and the exit should be the same on either side. If it's a bevel, then the, the length will be slightly altered based on the amount of beveling. And what we also need to note that is we have to follow something called the rovse hay technique of suturing where the peripheral sutures are more longer and tighter and as you start coming to the central visual axis it is much more, so much more superficial and much more smaller. Also what we have to note is a zone of compression between the two sutures. So it is very important that you space the sutures in just such a way that the zone of uh, compression actually overlaps with each other. If it is stellate injury, then the individual limbs have to be sutured first and then followed by the central purse ringing. Sometimes if there is still a defect after doing the purse string sutures, you might have to put glue or sometimes very rarely even a small piece of corneal tissue. Now this is just a, a video showing a very large corneal sclero tear. The first thing that you need to do is to actually suture the anatomical landmarks and limbus being the so uh, the anatomical uh, landmark and then you go on either side of the sclera and well as the cornea in a purse string fashion. Sometimes there might be iris uh, tissue also prolap uh, tissue prolapsing out. Now if it is macerated or if the duration is more than 24 hours, it is generally required that we abscess the tissue. 
care to be taken that we try to cut it flesh to the iris uh, to the corneal plane and then the remaining suturing is done as per the principle that we just described and sometimes if it's a small skill tie you have to do a peritomy to see the extent of the injury sometimes there might be vitreous presenting also at the corneal tear so it's very important that you do a good uh, vitrectomy before you start the suturing process now these are just clinical photos of the pre and the post op uh, pictures of the corneal tear uh, post operatively it's very important to do a b scan and x ray to rule out an intraocular foreign body broad spectrum antibiotics like ofloxacin or gatafloxacin can be given along with topical steroids cyclopregic can be added and if the pressure is high anti glaucoma medication and the systemic antibiotics that we have started pre can be continued at least for 5 days following the surgery now coming to penetrating injury if the wound is less than 2 mm less than 25% and away from the visual axis you can just do a close observation if it if there are larger tears with more than 50% corneal thickness shelf the incision you can just put a bcl for tectonic support along with antibiotic drops but if it is more than 6 mm and it involves more than 50% with visual loss definitely suturing is required to conclude uh, corneal tear should be diligently dealt with as an, as an emergency basis so as to improve both structural and functional outcome it is prudent prudent to apply the principles of suturing to get the best possible outcome and timely intervention and meticulous evaluation can salvage vision and improve the visual quality in these compromised eyes thank you <clears throat> thank you sir for that beautiful insight on corneal tear repair any questions from the audience uh so regarding corneal tear when they present uh, what about uh, doing a b scan on so generally it is generally not preferred this is our institute is normally do as a as a post op investigation so a post op investigation of a ct scan along with yeah. the retina evaluation yeah. to be preferred the thing is if you are doing also you can just do a very gentle b scan to get closer but but generally it is preferred as a post op thank you so much Uh, now i would request dr manju anup working at uh, giridhar eye hospital as a glaucoma consultant she will be speaking on management of acute angle closure glaucoma for optical outcomes a very good morning to all thanks anjana for the invite i'll be talking on the management of acute angle closure glaucoma uh, what happens here is there will be a sudden obstruction of the aqueous outflow through the trabecular meshwork leading to raised intraocular pressure it's an ophthalmic emergency so now we'll go on to the pathophysiology what are the mechanisms involved the first one is pupillary block here the a functional obstruction happens at the pupillary plane between the iris and the lens so the aqueous uh, collects behind in the posterior chamber and the iris pushes po forwards and it uh, op closes the angle the next is plateau iris configuration here there is an anterior insertion of the iris on to the uh, ciliary body and uh, uh, this because of this when the pupil gets dilated the angle gets obstructed in case of ciliocoroidal effusion uh, uh, there will be ciliary body edema and anterior rotation of the ciliary body so there will be uh, entire iris lens diaphragm will be pushed forwards and this in turn lead to um, angle obstruction in aqueous misdirection the same mechanism because of the posterior flowing of the aqueous the entire iris lens diaphragm is pushed forwards now come moving on to the etiology first one is pupillary block it happens in acute primary angle closure glaucoma Uh, secondary to iris bombe secondary to inflammation uveitic or in silicon oil filled eye anteriorly subluxated lens drugs causing midriasis then microspherophakia plateau iris configuration in plateau iris syndrome ciliocoroidal effusion happens in inflammatory conditions like vkh or scleritis then drugs uh, causing ciliocoroidal effusion one the most common is topiramate even diamox can cause ciliocoroidal effusion then tumor sourced and then aqueous misdirection uh, symptoms and signs i'm not going into the details as you all know the presentation then diagnosis you need a detailed history to know uh, the drug um, drug intake whether any history of drug intake they may not uh, reveal uh, when they come with the uh, acute episode then you have to do a visual acuity and refractive error to see uh, to know the etiology 
then slit lamp evaluation intraocular pressure gonioscopy and dilated fundus examination sometimes you may need other tests like ubm or b scan to confirm your diagnosis then coming to the management the primary aim is reduction of intraocular pressure you can use oral and uh, topical anti glaucoma medication to control the inflammation you have to use topical or sometimes even um, uh, st oral steroids then you have to manage the underlying pathology so now look at some cases this is a 64 year old female who presented with acute onset of headache nausea and the right eye pain redness watering and diminution of vision for one day this was her presentation on examination uh, the right eye uncorrected visual acuity was counting fingers 3 meters with typical signs and symptoms of acute angle closure like conjunctival congestion, epithelial edema, shallow AC, uh, lens was cataractus, mid dilated fixed pupil with glaucom flecken, hazy view of the disc. Her intraocular pressure was 62 millimeters and the gonioscopy differed in that eye. However, the other eye gonioscopy showed occludable angles. So here the diagnosis is acute primary angle closure glaucoma and the mechanism here is pupillary block. So you have to uh, reduce the intraocular pressure first for which you can use oral and uh, topical anti-glaucoma medication. Once the IOP reduces you have to break the attack and give uh, pilocarpine eye drops and as soon as uh, the media is clear you have to do a laser peripheral iridotomy. And postoperatively, you can treat with uh, steroids and the anti glaucoma medications as uh, required. Second case, it's a 68 year old female presented with acute onset headache, nausea, with right eye pain, redness, watering since one day. The, this was the presentation. This picture was taken on the next day when her pressure reduced. On examination, her uncorrected visual acuity was hand movements and uh, the conjunctival congestion, epithelial edema, shallow AC and the lens was showing mature cataract, mid dilated and fixed pupil. There was no view of the disc. Intraocular pressure was 56 millimeters of mercury. Other eye was pseudophagic with CD ratio 0.4 and the angles were open. So this was a case of lens induced acute angle closure and here also the mechanism was pupillary block. So again reduce the intraocular pressure and then steroids, laser peripheral iridotomy. Uh, I prefer to do a LPI before the cataract surgery if the pupil is constricted. If it is in mid dilated fixed stage maybe you can even go in for a direct cataract surgery. The next case is a 42 year old female who presented with acute onset of diminution of vision both eyes since two days duration and this was her presentation. On examination her uncorrected visual acuity was counting fingers 3 meters in both eyes which was improving to 6, six parts with minus 3 diopter sphere and the, however the patient was not having any vision problem previously and she was not using any glasses. Conjunctiva was showing mild congestion, cornea was relatively clear, AC was shallow and the pupils were round sluggish, disc was healthy, intraocular pressure was 46 and 48 millimeters and the gonioscopy revealed closed angles. It was a very convex iris and I couldn't even indent and open. So looking at the picture which is not very uh, 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 very much it is not like uh, acute angle closure attack I asked about the history then she told she is on treatment for migraine and she is on topiramate 25 milligram per day since three weeks so here the diagnosis is a drug induced and acute angle closure and the mechanism is posterior pushing that's why she got uh, minus myopic shift in refraction we did a UBM to confirm the ciliocoroidal effusion and here the management again you have to reduce the acute uh, um, IOP rise with uh, topical and oral anti-glaucoma medications and she was started on steroids uh, sometime most of the time you can it will get away with only the topical steroids but sometimes depending on the extent of uh, effusion you may need a systemic steroid. Atropine plays cycloplegics plays a major role and the most importantly you have to stop the offending drug and in five days time her AZ was deepened and in two weeks it was back to normal even the ultrasound. Um, 
This was a case of 64 year old female who presented with acute onset left eye pain, redness, watering since two days and this was her picture. Her uncorrected visual acuity was uh, 660 which improving to 69 parts in the left eye. Conjunctiva was showing diffuse scleral congestion, cornea was relatively clear, shallow AC, cataractous lens, round and sluggish pupil and the disc was showing edema. Her intraocular pressures were 42 millimeters and the gonioscopy revealed closed angles in the left eye. However, the angles were open in the right eye. So, considering uh, this as a scleritis, we did a B scan and noticed the fluid uh, T sign. And here it is an acute secondary angle closure again because of the posterior pushing mechanism. The management is same as in the previous case and she was treated for uh, uh, scleritis with oral and topical steroids with cycloplegics also given and in about a week's time her AZ deepened and uh, angles became open. Coming to the last case, this was a 52, 54 year old male who was uh, a who had undergone uh, phaco vitrectomy with silicon oil 10 days back. He presented with acute onset of left eye pain, redness since one day. This was the present uh, presentation. On examination, the uncorrected visual acuity was counting fingers 2 meters. Conjunctiva was showing some congestion. There was some amount of epithelial edema, but the AC was showing iris bombay. The lens, it was a pseudophagic eye. Pupil was less than mid dilated because the patient was already on homide. These details were not clear because it was an oil filled eye. Intraocular pressure was 43 millimeters and gonioscopy was deferred in this case, the other, uh, in this eye and the other eye it was open angle. So here the mechanism is again pupillary block but uh, it is due to acute secondary angle closure which was uh, inflammatory in this case. So, I gave Dimox stat, then topical anti-glaucoma medications and then since the view was a bit clear, I did a PA on the same day and here the thing is as soon as you do the PA, there will be an aqueous into, flow into the anterior chamber and iris flattens immediately and uh, patient was, these patients may need uh, a more uh, uh, frequent uh, steroids otherwise the pay, this PA may get closed again. I have even done 4 to 5 times PA in these cases, oil filled eyes with uh, iris bombay. So to conclude, reduction of intraocular pressure is the first line of treatment in acute angle closure regardless of the underlying etiology. It is critical for the clinician to distinguish the underlying mechanism as the treatment protocols are markedly different. The definitive treatment for pupillary block is laser peripheral iridotomy. Prophylactic LPA should be considered in other eye if occludable angles. In secondary acute angle closure, additional treatment is determined by the course and you have to make sure you, it, it's very important that prompt and proper management helps to prevent irreversible optic nerve head damage. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Manju for that wonderful talk. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next talk. So I invite Dr. Sanjana uh, to talk about chemical injuries. She's a... Uh, uh, she manages the corneal services uh, at Agarwal Eye Hospital, Cochin and Kotem. Thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank KSOS for giving me the opportunity of conducting this IC. And thank you for the audience to making up the time to come and attend it. So my topic today is emergency management in chemical injury. So chemical injury is one of the most common causes of visual morbidity in younger patients and it is up to on us how to manage in those 24 hours so that we make sure that the vision is safeguarded. So whenever a patient presents with chemical injury, it is to be understood that we do not rely, take the history or waste time on clinical examination. Patient has to be immediately made to lie down. Any particulate matter should be removed on lid eversion, double eversion and a thorough saline wash has to be given. Now coming to the saline wash, the choice of solution is actually ideally the difoterine solution which is hypotonic in nature. So hypotonic solutions basically help in reducing the corneal edema and bringing out the solution, uh, all the chemical solutions. So amphoteric in nature means that it can be used for both acids as well as alkalis. In case difoterine is not available, then we can use balanced salt solution 
रिंगल एक्टेट और नॉर्मल सलाइन विच आर ऑल बेसिकली आइसोटोनिक टैप वाटर शुड बी आइडियली अवॉइडेड एंड शुड बी यूज ओनली इफ नथिंग इज अवेलेबल इन अ पर्टिकुलर सिनारियो फॉर आई वॉश नाउ वंस अ स्टेबल पी एच इज अचीव देन वी गो इन फॉर असेसमेंट ऑफ स्लिट लैम्प एंड देन सीवियरिटी ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम इज डॉक्यूमेंटेड so coming to history taking we should be aware as to what are the common ingredients in which these chemicals are found so most common substances that we come into contact are ammonia or lime so ammonia is found in clinical agents fertilizers or refrigerants and lime is found in plasters cements and white wash coming to acids car batteries are some of the ex exposure to chemicals that is sulfuric acid and this is a very very strong acid hydrochloric acid which is seen in swimming pool is comparatively a weaker acid so this history taking is very important because each of these chemicals have their own way of acting and the prognostic value is dependent on the type of alkali or acid that is been exposed so if it is an acid injury they normally denature the denature and precipitate the proteins and thus create a barrier for further penetration and hence comparatively less harmful whereas strong alkalis they saponify the fatty acids in the cell membrane thus destroying the collagen proteolytic collagen and also releasing proteolytic enzymes which then becomes a vicious cycle and further damage not only the ingredient or the chemical we need to know the quantity the duration of contact area of contact as well as depth of penetration before we go in to understand the prognostic values so following the history taking we go in for clinical evaluation now before going to clinical evaluation we need to know the classification and grading now why is this important to assess the severity of the chemical injury to approach towards the treatment condition in this case and also to know the prognosis of the patient with respect to the visual rehabilitation so ruper hall and duas had come up with a classification and to summarize they basically indicate that any any condition where there is more than 30% of limbal ischemia leads to a guarded prognosis following chemical injury so now that we know the gradings we have to first see for the lid to check for any kind of a thermal injury because these chemicals can be heated also so if there is any kind of a lid necrosis or any lid damage once that is done we going to find out the degree of conjunctival involvement where staining is very important along with double eversion so once we see the conjunctiva we need to see the limbus so in limbus i am 100% sure that this kind of a total limbal ischemia can be easily picked up but also picking up subtle changes in early limbal ischemia is also very important when it comes to management so when the cornea is stained sometimes you may get early pe is seen in this in grade 1 injuries or in grade 4 injuries we may see a significant epithelial and stromal necrosis with stromal hydration so after the clinical evaluation and history taking as we have already seen the immediate phase of management is already done so then we divide the management into acute phase management that lasts up to 7 days the intermediate phase for 2 weeks followed by the chronic phase so in the acute phase we have to start the patient with copious topical steroids even if there is an epithelial defect so the preferable choice of uh, steroids is normally prednisolone acetate or dexamethasone as they are stronger and they have a better anti inflammatory action after 7 days we need to stop the steroids and then we have the collagen taking into action and these are anti collagen and thus then can cause the further melting of cornea so it's very important to start copious steroids initially and after 7 days taper the steroids along with that we have the additive treatment of preservative free artificial tears which is at least half an hourly or one hourly topical antibiotic in the form of ointments is preferred anti glaucoma medications as these alkalis when they penetrate can cause trabeculitis or block in the trabeculo meshwar topical and systemic vitamin c supplements is a very important part of the treatment as they have a pro collagen activity so topical if it could be prepared 10% topical vitamin c is preferred which is normally given 2 hourly and orally mandatory 4 times a day has to be given at least for 1 to 2 months and this can be super added with a systemic tetracycline like tablet doxycycline which is given bd for 15 to 20 days if you have the provision of arranging uh, autologous serum or pl plasma rich uh, platelets in such cases can be used for grade 4 and above chemical injuries so whenever there's a chemical injury we all know the inflammatory cytokines are released causing further and further necrosis so in case it's a very grade 4 grade 3 and above kind of a chemical injury we need to immediately take up the patient for surgical management also which involves epithelial debridement with or without amniotic membrane transplantation amniotic membrane fixed along with the simblepharon ring 
and if this is not possible, if there is significant uh, conjunctival uh, necrosis, then tenoplasty also can be done. So here is a video where a prokera ring is being placed so that there is no simplifron formation as well as the amniotic membrane acts as an anti-inflammatory agent preventing corneal necrosis. So once the acute management is done, the next goal is mainly to reconstruct the ocular surface because by then we have an idea as to what is the extent of damage and how much treatment is further required to reconstruct and visually rehabilitate the patient. So when it comes to reconstruction or chronic management, there are three components that need to be handled. The fornix management, the limbal stem cell deficiency to be managed as well as the corneal scars. So when it comes to fornicial management, the simblephrons have to be released with or without amniotic membrane to form the fornix as well as lid reconstruction so that the extra ocular movements are comfortable. Coming to limbal stem cell deficiency, depending on unilateral or bilateral exposure of chemical injury, we have the conjunctival limbal autograft, we have the live related autograft, but the latest that we prefer is the simple limbal epithelial transplant, which has very high prognosis as well as better surgical outcome with less re requirement of any kind of a laboratory conjunctival cells. So here is a picture, we have had previous sessions where they have sp spoken about SLET in detail. Now coming to chronic management in scar of the cornea, we can either do DALC in case of superficial corneal damage, we can go for an optical keratoplasty or if this does not work and there is free, frequent failure of the keratoplasty because of limbal stem cell deficiency, we may even have to go for a Boston K probe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjana, for that uh, amazing talk. Next, I'll be talking to you about uh, central retinal artery occlusion. So, Dr. Rahul is working at uh, Chaitanya Hospital, Palari Vettam, taking care of the vitreoretina retina department. So, slides, please. So, very good morning. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sanjana for this uh, wonderful invite. <clears throat> So, uh, central retinal artery occlusion is analogous to an acute stroke of the eye. The most common cause is embolism. This emboli may be a cholesterol, calcific material or fibrin. Not just the embolus, sometimes even an occlusive thrombus just immediately posterior to the lamina cribrosa might also cause a CRAO. So, CRAO might be either a non-arthritic or arthritic. So, when we talk about arthritic CRAO, we are basically concerned with giant cell arthritis. The treatment of, for that is mostly steroids. And in non-arthritic, it could be either a permanent CRAO, a transient one, when many of the times a patient comes to us with history of TIA, and it could, or it could be a CRAO with retinal sparing. So, once you see a patient of CRAO, rule out arthritic CRAO. For that, you require an ESR, CRP, and platelet. Then, look for the vascular causes, like check the blood pressures, fasting, lipid sugars, and blood, uh, lipid profile. If you want to look out for the embolic source, you can do a carotid ultrasound or an echocardiogram. Young patients look for hypercoagulable states like looking for the protein CNS, uh, factor, factor leading mutations and anti -ap -lap. For the uh, If you want to rule out the vasculitis, you have to do an ANA, ANCA or ACE. Also try to make sure that you are know, missing a case of myeloproliferative disorders. So get a peripheral smear and HB electrophoresis in these patients. Now, the management of CRO could be broadly classified into three types, acute, subacute, and long-term. The acute and subacute management, the treatment lies with us as an ophthalmologist, and the long-term treatment is with an intensivist. So the acute management is basically to restore the ocular perfusion to the central retinal artery. The subacute treatment is uh, management uh, relies on preventing secondary neovascular complications, and the long-term is to prevent vascular ischemic, ischemic events to the other eye or probably other end organs. So the acute management is, you know, the standard therapy that we usually follow is, you start the patient on, you can give a sublingual isobar dinitrate or systemic pentoxifiline. You can give a, uh, even uh, inhalation of a carbogen or hyperbaric oxygen, ocular massage either with the lids closed or with the gonio lens, and acetazolamide and mannitol with AC paracentesis. A key point to remember with the paracentesis is like, Unlike in the surgery when we do a gradual one, here the paracentesis should be rapid. The, the goal is to create a sudden decompression. Okay, And or most of the times you have to use a combination of this therapy. 
thrombolytics has a very good role so the ideal golden time is about 4 hours to 6 hours so it could be either an intraarterial fibrinolysis or intravitreal uh, intravenous uh, fibrinolysis so for an intraarterial basically the cannulation is done in the ophthalmic artery and you but the only in, uh, the problem is you require a, a very good neuro uh, in, in, interventional neurology setup for that it can also be administered intravenously uh, but the only prop uh, the good thing about that is that you the hemorrhagic complications are actually less now the subacute management uh, is to prevent the uh, development of neovascularization and neovascular glaucoma now the prevalence of uh, you know you see seeing neovascularization happening in a case of uh, CRA is very debatable you know uh, literature states about from 2.5 to 32 percent cases can develop neovascularization the ideal time is the range when they can actually develop is about 2 to 16 weeks. So ideally, such patients when you see, like if you see, unlike a case of CRVO, where the chance of neovascularization is very high, CRVO, the, the chance of NVG happening is very less. So ideally speaking, so probably up to 4 months, you should be ideally looking for uh, uh, looking for the development of any neovascularization in such cases. Now, before I come to this case, uh, since we have few audience today, I would like to ask, uh, a show of hand how many of you have seen a case of CRAO we always tell you know we always blame uh, like the patients like most of cases of CRAO we get to see them after one month six months so probably it's a lost cause so show of hand how many of you have seen a case of CRAO within 30 minutes anybody over here 30 minutes how did it go the management no 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 I, I know the management I'm asking how did that end up for the patient patient had some vision, <laughs> definitely. Uh, he, the patient ended up having uh, 6 by 18 vision. Okay, so you managed conservatively? No. Yeah. Okay. So I had a very bad experience. Like during my fellowship days, uh, I was in Shankar Netrale. So there's this case, patient who came to us who had already lost his vision in one eye to CRAO. He had um, uh, he had underwent multiple, uh, you know, volvular heart surgeries. And he used to stay very close to the college road where Shankar Netrale is because he, most of his follow-up was at Apollo Hospital, which is in Greens Road, and SN2. He was he, he developed he lost his vision in CRO in right eye, developed the symptoms. He was already advised from here that the moment you develop some symptoms, you take a paper bag, you start the paper bag uh, ventilation, and then come back. He reached to us in 30 minutes. We did all everything what we had in our armamentarium. We did the gonio massage, we gave him mannitol, AC parenthesis, synthesis, everything. Finally, it was a lost cause. So, you know. That was the one time when, uh, you know, I was wondering, like anything, you know, literature, we give all this treatment, but this all this treatment are up to ch chances. Because even when we send the patient to a, you know, multi uh, intensivist, the, the, their treatment is usually a guarded approach you know, to prevent this uh, further, probably stroke or something like that, rather than intervening for the CRA, central retinal artery uh, uh, block. So, this is uh, one, I would like to acknowledge my senior, Dr. Jaydeep. So this was an 83-year-old lady who came with sudden painless loss of vision in her right eye of four days. The vision was hand movements. The left eye was already lost because she had a total coronal opacities. The vision was she was blind in that eye. So this was a fundus picture. You can see a cellular artery sparing uh, uh, CRAO. So finally, he had to do something, you know, especially to get fitness for surgery in such cases is very difficult. So he subjected the patient to vitrectomy. So I'll just show the video here. I'll just run through the steps here. So uh, this is a normal uh, vitrectomy that has been done. So we do a, something called as a hypotonous vitrectomy in such cases. So initially they, there was no PVD. So IVT was used to stain the vitreous and a PVD was in, in, induced. And we try not to do a complete vitrectomy at least till mid periphery the vitrectomy is done. And then with a soft tip cannula, we, he's doing a compression over the central retinal artery. He's trying to milk the uh, embolus uh, away from the central part and to the periphery. After that, he's used, he has used an MVR blade to kind of dissect the common adventitious sheet. So what happens is the central little artery and the vein are encased in a sheath and he's trying to dissect it with an MVR blade. Okay, so he cannot do it completely, but at least some amount of it is being done. And then whatever bits of tissue that is left there has been taken up by using an end gripping forceps.
and finally again with the uh, with the cutter tip gentle pressure is uh, uh, applied over the settling art artery to kind of dislodge it and then what it is done is he's doing a fluid air exchange okay and like i say when we start the vitrectomy the pressure is at around usually when we do a vitrectomy we keep the pressure set around 25 30 depending on what case we do but here the pressures are kept at 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury column okay and finally he has used a uh, fax and uh, refill the uh, like replace the entire fluid in the eye with air now and then you create sudden fluctuation I iop you increase the pressures from 5 to 60 and then suddenly put it back to 5 so you want to come decompress the globe multiple times okay it has its own risk and completion but that is the only thing that we can do here so finally uh, so just like I said, the IOP is done is called as something called as hypotonus vitrectomy. So the, the pressures are done at, uh, at the range of 5 to 10. PVD induction, so many times you might not, you might see the PVD is already induced. So the thing is, the logic here is, this vitreous is very attached to the uh, blood vessels. So when you lift it slowly, it's kind of milking the vessels. And then try to dissect the common adventitious sheath, massage the central lateral artery and repeated IOP fluctuation. Now, we can do like when you do vitrectomy we can reduce this fluctuation of the iop with the fluid as well as with air but what happens is because of surface tension air has a much more better tamponade effect so that is the reason fx was like the fluid air exchange was done and then the iop fluctuation was done so this is the final outcome the uh, this is the pre-op picture and this is the post-op picture the vision improved from hand movements to so 6 12. So uh, also one more technique that has been done, uh, re reported in literature pre previously is like they do a vitrectomy, they kind of, since the retinal artery is already occluded, they kind of make a small nick in it and using a, a stillet, 50, 51 uh, gauge stillet, they kind of recan try to recanalize it. But the problem with what happens is the very variable results. So vitrectomy is some one thing which we can keep it in our mind. The first uh, report, like, not report, like a uh, very few surgeons actually do it. Dr. Mahesh Mugam was the first person where I heard like, you know, vitrectomy can be a option for it. He had operated on a doctor actually. Uh, I think uh, sir might be knowing that case. As a doctor, he had operated, the patient finally ended up getting 618 vision. There are, there are few surgeons who are still doing vitrectomy. I find uh, by, uh, like for my bad luck, I still haven't got a case where I could uh, try this. But vitrectomy does definitely have a role. And you know, the time frame is very debatable because we don't have much long large case series about uh, doing a vitrectomy for such cases but the general you know uh, like uh, reference that we take is up to one week we can actually take such cases for vitrectomy so the take home message is CRU is an ocular emergency the risk factors that predisposes also predispose to cardi uh, cardiac peripheral and CVEs so the moment the acute management is done from our side you have to send such patients to uh, intensivist and uh, that is the most important uh, message I would like to give. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Any questions from the audience? So, thank you for informing us that all is not lost. We still have a vitrectomy option in such cases. So, now I would request Dr. Siju Joseph, sir, to take the dais. So, Dr. Siju, Siju, sir, is working as an oculoplasty surgeon at Lotus Eye Hospital as well as Aster Med City Ernakulam. So he will be speaking on management strategies of orbital cellulitis when they approach to your clinic. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Sanjana, for ha having me. Thank you, KSOS. And thanks to my seniors and friends who are here. Um, so good morning. Uh, my talk is on the management of strategy uh, of orbital cellulitis. Mm, uh, generally, uh, demographically, it's male-female preponderance is the same. Uh, you find it in almost every age group. Usually there's a history of some uh, ENT or dental infections, upper respiratory tract in infections. There could be recent trauma, surgery. There might be a long-term uh, watering from the eye, eyelid swellings, uh, next stiffness. Some of the pre patients presented uh, with meningitis, meningitis it itself to me. Uh, now, uh, as you all know, this uh, orbital cellulitis is the second stage of uh, Chandler's staging. So to begin with, it, it might be uh, preceptal cellulitis. As you go, uh, as the infection crosses the septum and goes into the orbit, you will find proptosis, axial uh, proptosis, which is uh, in, in diffuse disease, abaxial in case of abscess uh, formation. Uh, there might be resistance to uh, retropulsion. There would be a decreased ocular motility causing uh, diplopia. 
uh, optic nerve compression retrobulbar or optic neuritis might cause uh, loss of vision color vision uh, loss of color vision uh, and uh, has rapd uh, there could be retinal venous congestion, uh, CRVO, CRAO, or vasculitis. Uh, patients might have periorbital anesthesia, paresthesia, and then uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis, subdural empyema, and further on into the brain. Systemic presentation would be malaise, fever, nasal congestion, uh, even tooth pain. Cavernous sinus involvement and beyond would uh, show headache, nausea, vomiting, progressing ophthalmoplegia, anisocoria, anest anesthesia. Uh, and this might start to affect the other eye as well. Initially, it might be by a sixth nerve palsy. Uh, then the patient progresses on to decreased consciousness. Etiology. Well, the source very often is the sinuses, and most often it is the ethmoid sinus. Infections also com can come from the eyeball, the eyelid, or the face. Foreign bodies that's, that have been remaining there for some time the spread could be hematogenous, especially because uh, we have a, a valveless venous plexus in that area. Uh, organisms very often are staph or a streptococcus. And nowadays, it's more often MRSA. Uh, previously, we used to say about hemophilus influenza being more common in kids, but now, nowadays, due to vaccinations, it is not all that common. In cases of trauma, you might have gram-negative bacilli. Uh, Long-term hospital stay, you might have Pseudomonas, Klebsiella. Uh, in dental infections, you might have a mixed aggressive anaerobic or aerobic uh, infection. And of late, many of us have heard of cases of mucormycosis or even aspergillosis in cases of poor, poor immunity. Diagnosis very often is clinical, but other modalities help. Imaging helps to... Uh, pinpoint the source and know the extent of the infection. CT brain and orbit is done with contrast with axial and coronal view. Shows sinusitis, uh, subperiosteal abscess, soft tissue extension towards the apex and beyond. MRI with uh, contrast would be helpful in cavernous sinus and brain involvement. Um, slides and cultures are very often taken if there is pus from there, swab from the conjunctiva or the nose and blood, but very often you don't get these organisms from blood. Uh, if there is a clear-cut uh, pus, yes, that might uh, give some results. There might be uh, a shift to the, uh, I mean, there might be a WBC count uh, race. And again, since many of the patients are immunocompromised or having diabetes, blood sugars help. Uh, having your colleagues in a multi-speciality hospital like mine definitely helps. Uh, ENT, dental, uh, neurology, neurosurgery for that matter maybe, uh, and if you have an infectious disease consulta uh, consultant, then definitely involve him. Differential diagnosis for this is a preceptal celluloidus, orbital tumor, sarcoidosis, thyroid eye disease, orbital myositis, ruptured dermal cyst, uh, CCF, uh, pseudotumors, and in children maybe even rhabdomyosarcoma or neuroblastoma. Management, systemic antibiotics is the, is the mainstay. Uh, antibiotics, give IV antibiotics for three days at least, and then uh, one to three weeks oral. We generally start with amoxidin clavinic acid. Mm, the dosage is uh, divided into the, uh, in three, uh, three doses in a day uh, at uh, uh, around 500 mg, three, uh, three doses per day. Uh, in pediatrics, uh, you, fo you follow the, uh, you titrate according to the uh, protocol, which is 20 to 30 milligrams per kg per day, uh, third hourly. Uh, you can give, in cases of M clearly proven MRSA, then vancomycin, uh, 15 mg per kg per day, uh, with uh, ampicillin, sulbactam, or with uh, piperacillin, tazobactam, or with ceftriaxone. If the patient is allergic to penicillin and cephalosporins, then uh, you can stick to your fluoroquinolones, but you need to uh, add metronidazole just in case. Steroids, yes, there is uh, some people have the opinion that uh, steroids should only be started after 48 hours, but uh, I generally tend, once I start the antibiotics, I start the steroids. Uh, antifungals uh, have a role in case of uh, aspergillosis or uh, mucor. Amphotericin B, uh, and itraconazole is what's given for aspergillosis. Liposomal uh, amphotericin B uh, is more effective for mucor when it's uh, adjuncted with posaconazole. 
then you can uh, add topical medications, uh, uh, topical antibiotics uh, with steroid ointments are what I give uh, for the lid swelling. Uh, intraorbital amphotericin B uh, can be given in cases of mucor. This is uh, the topical application is generally followed following hot fermentation. Lubricating eye drops help to prevent the exposure and dryness of the cornea. Control IOP. Try to avoid prostaglandin analogs. Nasal decongestion is given to, for three to five days, if required. Now, uh, when you have complications from uh, orbital, cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, you might have to do an IND in case of pus formation. Uh, a lateral canthotomy uh, or cantholy and cantholysis can be done, may be required if the optic nerve is being involved. Needle aspiration in subperiosteal abscess uh, might help. But if you see, the uh, generally subperiosteal abscesses are uh, at the medial wall because, as I said before, the etiology is at this, uh, the source is generally from the ethmoid sinuses. And there's this thin lamina papyracea that's separating the, the orbit from the ethmoids. So if you are involving the ENT, definitely the, it might be easier for them to access us through the, through the nose. Because there might be a, a break in the lamina papyracea through which the infection is getting in. So again, FES, uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery by the ENT in case of sinusitis, which isn't going away with our treatment. Uh, like I said before, antibiotics and steroids. This helps generally to reduce the infection, but if it isn't, then, then the ENT plays a role here. DCR in case of sac involvement, craniotomy and evacuation of brain abscess, aggressive sur surgical debridement in, of all necrotic tissues uh, in case of uh, orbital uh, mucor. So this is one patient who presented with orbital cellulitis and uh, uh, neck area skin cellulitis about uh, seven to eight years ago. He was diabetic. All he had was a history of some insect falling into his eye. He's, a, he's an agriculturalist. So he kept that. He's a diabetic and it's, it's severely uncontrolled diabetic. So uh, what happened is his right eye uh, had cellulitis, but generally the cellulitis in mucor or aspergillus isn't all that active and fulminant, but uh, because they are immunocompromised. But his, his uh, 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 orbital cellulitis, I mean, his lid swellings were pretty large, uh, uh, pretty tight lid swelling was there, and we couldn't see the pupil. Eventually, um, uh, they, they did, uh, they, uh, while taking care of the neck wound, uh, their swab revealed uh, mucor. There was a classic brown uh, tint of the fat around there, and uh, we started seeing that in the eye as well. Eye movement was severely restricted. There was, he was starting to have uh, uh, CRVO. Uh, now the other eye started getting affected. He started getting a sixth nerve palsy in the other eye. So then, yeah, so then the cavernous sinus was found to be uh, affected. The ENT went in and did their surgery, and we were pulled in for doing an excentration. Evisceration, sorry, excentration. The eyelids were spared. Tarsorafi wasn't done initially because we had to apply. Uh, local uh, antifungals, uh, this is from the neck, neck wound, repeated uh, debridement had to be done. And then over time, over a, a course of about three months, it healed. Uh, yeah, and later the tarsorafi was done. He's alive and walking around. He's, he has got some political uh, affiliation, uh, so can't reveal his name or anything. Anyway. You need to follow up these patients very frequently. Initially, daily or twice daily assessment uh, of all the uh, clinical symptoms and signs. Repeat CT might be done after three days, if it's not improving, to look for periosteal abscess. The prognosis, prognosis is generally good when prompt treatment is given, antibiotics or drainage, else blindness, and maybe rarely even death. In summary, the baseline treatment is antibiotics and, and anti-inflammatory, anti, anti inflammatories mainly steroids. Surgery for complications and timely intervention saves eyes and lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.
So to conclude this, I'll be speaking on management of phacolytic glaucoma. Uh, whenever a red eye comes to the OPD, we normally have some of the common differential diagnosis. It could be a viral conjunctivitis, uveitis, endophthalmitis or phacolytic glaucoma. So today's topic of mine is to handling a phacolytic glaucoma in the emergency clinic. So in such conditions, patients normally present with vision that is less than uh, hand movements with the raised IOP of more than 30 to 40 millimeter uh, mercury and they present with uh, circumciliary congestion, corneal edema. AC cells and flares can be identified in case the cornea is not cloudy or mid dilated uh, pupil as well as a white mature cataract. So once we come into conclusion that this is a lens induced glaucoma, some of the other causes for raised IOP should also be kept in mind and that could be a uveitic open angle glaucoma, acute angle closure glaucoma, glaucoma secondary to trauma or a neovascular glaucoma. In case of uveitis, definitely we are going to find keratic precipitates. The list of causes for acute angle closure has already been mentioned previously. In neovascular glaucoma, it is very important to notice the new vessel seen in the iris or at the angle and history of trauma also helps us to aid towards glaucoma secondary to trauma. Now coming to uh, lens induced glaucoma, there are three types. The phacomorphic which actually causes secondary angle closure glaucoma because of the forward pushing of the lens that causes the narrowing of the angle and obstruction of the outflow of the aqueous. Then we have the phacoantigenic which is previously called as phacoanaphylactic where the lens itself's own antigens act as a uh, immune complex and the, this could be following a surgery or a penetrating trauma causing obstructions with trabecular measure and open angle glaucoma. So this is mainly an immunocomplex reaction. And finally the topic as discussed the phacolytic glaucoma where there is leaking of protein material from a hypermature cataract causing trabecular measure blockage cause leading to inflammatory glaucoma. So the ultimate management in such condition is basically lens extraction and an IOP control. So preoperatively before taking up the patient for surgery, we need to start the patient on oral anti-glaucoma agents like IV mannitol and tablet acetazolamide after confirming that the patient is not allergic to these medicines. Topical anti-glaucoma, prostaglin and analogs have to be avoided as this is an inflammatory condition and it is always better to start topical anti-inflammatory because it will bring down post-op inflammation. A detailed history of systemic comorbidities has to be taken as we cannot immediately take the patient for surgery if he is a very high hypertensive patient, uncontrolled diabetic. In such conditions, we may have to wait for some days before taking up for surgery. So coming to the ideal uh, intraoperative surgical technique, we have the ECC which unfortunately gives us a large incision causing an expulsive choroidal hemorrhage following sudden decompression. And then we also have a phaco but in this case because it is a shallow AC and an edematous cornea, the chances of post-op edema, the increased risk of endothelial cell loss and poor view is one of the some of the challenges faced. So ideally in these conditions going with a small incision cataract surgery is always safe and effective. Now coming to the intraoperative challenges that is faced in any of these procedures, firstly the view is going to be very hazy because of the corneal edema. Secondly, a shallow AC in a phacomorphic or if in cases of such case the instrument manipulation becomes difficult. Pupil dilation again it could be a mid dilated pupil or a pupil with posterior sinicae, again this is going to hamper the dilation and the smoothing of the surgery. And last but not least, because of the chronicity, we can also face with a fibrosed capsule and hence achieving an ideal rexis becomes a problem. So here is a video. Yes. So this is a video of an SICS surgery. So as you can see, the view is totally compromised. So in such conditions, you can also see that there is lens particles along the angles in this patient. So here a 5 ms after putting the superior rectus a 5 ms incision is done as most of the time in hypermature cataract the nucleus is going to be very small. 
So after completely thoroughly giving an AC wash, we see that the view is pretty clear. An ideal rexis is achieved. After that, after using a good amount of visco, the lens is brought into the anterior chamber and then extracted. Now extraction can be done by visco expression or in a sandwich technique, whichever is comfortable and suitable. Care should be taken that the AC depth should be maintained so that we do not cause any capsular back dialysis or a PC run. So as you can see, the result is good. Cornea is edematous because of the IOP, raised IOP, which following a couple of months has cleared. So in the hands of the expert, even FACO can work very well. But there are some very important challenges that, that are faced at the time of FACO. So in this case, there is a fibrosed capsule in this area. So attaining an act, a proper rexis becomes difficult in this scenario. So here the utrata or the rexis forceps and scissors can be used to get an adequate rexis. So once this is done, we go in for a FACO surgery. So the challenges faced during FACO is that the absence of posterior capsular, subcapsular plate as well as cortical matter. So the, normally the nucleus will be wobbly in nature and the high chances of catching the posterior capsule during the procedure. Once the initial uh, crack is uh, created, where a lot of care has to be taken to maintain the chamber in an adequate depth so that the posterior capsule does not come into the FACO probe. And the last piece removal is a very important step because there is no support posterior. So once this is done, a thorough AC wash has, be, has to be done in a manual or a coaxial method and then a lens can be placed. So some of the challenges as mentioned are posterior capsular rupture in either of the condition, more commonly it is faced in a phaco surgery, zonular dialysis if the cataract has been sitting for a very very long time, loose capsular bag, most of the time in such conditions if you are not taking adequate care the lens may be got out along with the capsular bag and occasionally we may see the phacolytic particles in the vitreous also and in such conditions it can be managed conservatively. So coming to post-operative follow, it is not done with just operating the patient and giving him ideal results. Normally there is a persistent inflammation for which steroids has to be given until the inflammation is controlled. Then if there is a cystoid macular edema, these patients should be given on a long term NSAIDs along with the close follow up by the retina consultants and also in case of a persistent rise in IOP, anti glaucoma medications have to be given to these patients. Some of the com uh, complications because of the loss of follow-up or late follow-up is that a permanent damage to the optic nerve or a permanent corneal decompensation which then leads to an endothelial transplant in such cases. Now most of the common questions that is there in this conditions, do we go for a combined procedure with FACO plus management of IOP with tabaculectomy or no? But the general consensus is to manage the cataract by surgery and manage the intraocular pressure by giving anti glaucoma medication because in this conditions Inflammation is there and there are high chances that the trabeculectomy may fail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sanjana. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Thank you very much.